I don't see Medicine Man Gallery or any of the Maynard Dixon books in your... Uh, there is a Maynard Dixon book, but it's not yours. Not mine. Oh, God, don't show that. <laughs> Where is it? Oh, right there is one. Oh, yeah, that's but actually... You know what? That's actually a great book. It is. It's yeah. such a great... That's Don, I'm going to get a shout out to Don Haggerty, but it's just a little book, The Life of Maynard Dixon, but it's a really great book. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. Well, I have Bill Alther on, and uh, thank you so much for taking the time today and figuring out how to get on to Zoom. <laughs> yes, it's always a learning experience for me. Yeah, for all of us. You know, I've been doing this podcast for six years, and then once the pandemic hit, it was like, oh, God, now what? How do I do this? And they're like, Zoom, and I'm like, what? And I thought yeah. the first time I did it, I thought, oh, this is not going to be great. And it was, it was like, oh, this is just as intimate. And in some respects, I think it's better because for a lot of individuals, they're in their own home, they feel better. And it's just not like in a studio looking two feet from, you know, two feet from my face. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Apparently it's not for you though. What? <laughs> Zoom? No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't done it much, so. Yeah, yeah, there's not much to do. So I met Bill, I'm just going to tell my audience, I met Bill at the um, uh, Willow Rock show where he was one of the uh, artists that was, it was a retrospective and sale. And how, how, how many artists are in that? I mean, it's still up right now, right? It's up to yeah. the end of the year. The I show? think so. Yeah. Through, through December. Um, this year it was um, 11, um, which is the, <clears throat> the most they've had. I think in the past, it's been more like eight or nine. Yes. So yeah, and we're talking great well, artists. Yeah, I mean that's a killer. That was a great show to get invited to, too. It sure was. Yeah, it, uh, surprised me. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just, yeah, it was just a great thrill to to be to participate. Yeah, um, and it was fantastic. for me a great thrill to meet people like yourself because yeah. I really wasn't familiar with your work. I, I'm yeah. sorry to say, um, but boy, I'm glad when I saw it. Yeah, well, I I appreciate it. I I really did appreciate you you talking to you there and uh, meeting your son and <clears throat> getting the free hat. And yeah, there so you on. go. <laughs> oh, you think it's free, huh? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Well, it's... I, I haven't told you about what I want to do, but we're gonna I'm gonna do something for the foundation. Okay. Won't won't cost you anything actually, but we're okay. we have an arts foundation that we're gonna try to raise a little funds. Um, and it, it'll involve those hats, but it's all it's it's all fun. It's easy and no big deal. So that that comes later. And okay. it's, not, it's not even that hat. So, <laughs> okay. um, so you know, I was really impressed with your artwork. I mean, I know I want to talk to you about your whole life, but I really can't um, say more how amazed I was of what you're doing. You know, especially that bear painting, which I would like to talk a little bit about. Um, okay. These pieces still are for sale at the Willow Rock, and you can call. I don't know if that one is, but you know there are pieces that you have entered that are still available, right? Yeah. Soon. There, as far as I know, there's still, uh, you know, maybe three pieces available. Is that one the polar bear one? The sniffing. I one? I, I would imagine it's still available. Yeah, that was know. one of your biggest paintings. Yeah, it was the big one. Yeah. Yeah, and that painting. Um, we'll put this for people who will watch this on YouTube. They can actually, we'll get an image from Bill on that and put it up so you can see it. But just explain a little bit of this one painting, just because I was just so intrigued by it. Okay. Well, you know, it's, it's polar bears, which I, you know, I had to, I was thinking about appropriate subject matter for that show. And then, but I, you know, I decided it's not about subject matter. This was a show I felt like I needed to do, um the things i was really wanting to do you know uh, i think that's when the paintings come out the best is when you're the most enthused and excited about them and um so i went ahead with the polar bears and um it's an idea i've had for a while of uh just sort of a little grouping of uh you know it was more about an arrangement of them is what i was what i was trying to pull off with that one and i thought a mother with a couple of cubs gave me the the pieces to arrange and uh so that's kind of how the whole composition evolved and um and the, you know the source material is from a couple of trips i've taken to churchill canada to uh spend 
about 10 days with the bears each time. So I've been up there for, you know, a total of 20 days or so now. And um, yeah, that really well, every day looking for bears. Yeah. <laughs> and those are the only animals that hunt men, right? I mean, uh, uh, they're one the of the very few. Yeah. But as a bear, it's the only one I think that actually. Yeah. 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 Humans. Yeah. They're generally the one that's, you know, uh, there, there are occasional black bears that, kind of are predatory i've heard up, up, especially in canada and alaska but they generally you know are pretty skittish but um polar bears are the are the ones that are consistently uh, somebody you got to look out for you know yeah yeah so i mean that's one of the things that impressed me you took two different trips you're spending 10 days at a crack going <laughs> after to get source material for your work and literally you know, you take your life into your own hands when you're out there. I mean, it's just, I mean, I know, well, the guy there, I, but, I, but even so, you know. Yeah, well, I, I go up there with a friend and then we hire a local guy there that 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 guides us around and he um, stands watch when we get out of the, and we're driving around in a vehicle, like a Suburban. Um, uh, and uh and generally when you spot the bears they're a ways away so you you uh you can get out and set up your camera equipment and and uh and then the, you know they're, they're curious and they you know and they're not afraid of people and so they're just going to keep doing what they're doing and if they happen to be coming your way they'll just continue mm -hmm. sauntering towards you but um and then and then they're also curious so as they get closer sometimes they're uh they're kind of like, well, I'm going to go check out that, yeah. that suburban parked over there. And so when they get to a certain distance, you get back in and roll the windows up. And um, but, you know, you can get so focused on the bear that's in front of you that uh, there's always the chance there's one behind you, uh, you know, laying down in behind a snowbank or or some yeah. wood bushes and this, and then it it wakes up or smells something and decides to get up and check it out. And so if you don't have somebody uh, that's just pretty much full-time paying attention and looking in 360 degrees, um, that that's not smart to not to, to. Uh -huh. so, so we, we have a guy that will um, go around with, he drive, he knows all the roads and he, uh, right. Um, and then he's our lookout and, and he's, he does have a shotgun, which, uh, they of course, uh, avoid using at all costs, but just, just in case, yeah. you know, the yeah. worst happens. Yeah. I'd want more than a shotgun it's, it's, myself, actually. The way we go about it, it's pretty safe. I mean, I, I, I've never felt, uh, you know, I, I don't, we never had any close calls or never, I never felt like we were, um, you know had to worry about anything and are you taking photos primarily or are you actually doing yeah in your stuff yeah there? it's it's all you know i love to paint on location and so on but um it's cold <laughs> i i couldn't do it up there you'd have to sit in the vehicle and then and then um your time is limited i mean 10 days is sounds like a lot but uh for that kind of a deal you you just want to use every minute you have especially if you're main objective is to get polar bear photos um so, so we just drive around all day looking for them and and there's other things there you you find ptarmigan and snowshoe hares and arctic foxes and right. and and there's plenty of other things too that you sort of stumble across so and why, so it's just a lot of fun yeah so why do that versus going Hey, Denver Art Museums, right? Or Art Zoo's there. I can just go up and look at polar bears and get all the reference material I want, and right. you know, see them in person, and you know, then go have a hot dog. Right. Well, um, uh -huh. uh, this, there's a, at least a couple of reasons. One is um, a lot of zoo animals look like zoo animals. Um, they uh, they don't get the they don't they're not working hard for their food and, and they, you know, they just lose that edge. They, uh, they just don't have, they, they're not animated and so on. Uh, they're just doing their daily thing. And quite honestly, I feel sorry for most of them. They're, they're bored, you know, and, and, and they're comfortable and bored. Yeah. So they just don't have the same 
Uh, they don't carry themselves the same way and, and so on. So, and then the other thing is just that firsthand ex experience of seeing things in their, in their wild place. Um, mm -hmm. There's just something about the experience that uh, sinks into the, the paintings. Um, yeah, I get it. That's like playing yeah. golf on a, on a uh, machine versus being out in the, on the course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, um, it's just, Kind of just having an understanding and a feel for for where where they are is, I think, real important. So, and well, we're and, and on top of all that, it's just fun. Yeah. Okay. I, there you, go. you know, most people go up there as just tourists to, just to see a bear. Right. And uh, and and so you combine that with uh, having a real purpose. Uh, right. It's no brainer. And we'll talk about this a little later, but you are a zoologist and know what you speak of. So when you talk about, you know, they don't look, they look like zoo animals, you actually know. This is something that you yeah. spend yeah, I, your life working on. Yeah. Well, and I think most most uh, artists that um, specialize in animals that really know enough, you know, they know, they know the difference too. So, and those are the, you know, I'm I'm out to uh um my you know I I want my work to to uh um pass the test with the people who know what they're looking at. Yeah, I got it. That makes sense. Well, the thing that passed the test for me was that painting was just as good as a landscape as it was with the bears on it. You could have yeah. taken those out and I would have been fully all engaged uh with that painting. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Well, the the landscape there is incredible. I mean, it's flat, you know, it's everything's pretty horizontal, but um just the colors and the, the you know, it's just amazing. Um, yeah, well, white's hard sleep. to do. People don't realize how difficult white is because white's not white, right? You no, know? it's anything but white and yeah, so uh, and I I've, I've said this plenty of times in, in other interviews and articles that I love painting white stuff because just for that reason, it's, uh, it's really, um, a composite of all the things that's that are surrounding it and mm -hmm. reflecting onto it, you know, whatever that white object is. Right. It's blues. It's everything. Yeah. And, and snow in particular is really, um, a challenge because it, uh, you know, it's it's little crystals that and each crystal is reflecting and refracting all this light and scattering it. And so um, it it's constantly changing. Um, you know, when I'm I'm painting snow on in person from life, um, it's really challenging because you look at it, you know, you look at it, you're constantly looking up and down and, and you know, looking at your subject and then back looking at your painting. And and every time I look away look at the painting and then look back at the snow, it looks like I'm seeing a different color than I just saw three seconds earlier, you know, mm -hmm. now it looks a little pink. And then I, and then I start putting a little pink in there and then I look back, Oh no, it, there's more, you know, there's some green there too, you know? Right. And it's just, it's just so elusive. And uh, so um, that's uh -huh. both um, uh, frustrating, but also challenging and rewarding, you know, to try to do that. That has to be a muscle to be able to <laughs> develop, to see those different shades of color. I'm sure you yeah. just didn't start day one and go, oh, I can see these different colors. I, I would assume that comes with experience and time. Yeah, I, I'm sure it does. I mean, um, I think your 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 perception of color and, and everything else really, uh, it's just like anything else. The more you do it, the better you get. Uh, yes. I think. Yes. And yeah. so... You consider yourself, and maybe you don't, but I'm going to assume you consider yourself a wildlife painter. Well, um, I suppose. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't use the word. I don't. I try not to use the uh, term wildlife artist, um, even though that's primarily what I do. But uh, um, I, I think wildlife artists <laughs> tended to be called wildlife artists as opposed to you don't hear other artists called figure artists or still life artists so right. much you know right. and uh so i i don't really use that label 
Um, and I, I would like to do other things. I, I do like doing landscapes and I've done, I've done still, I, I've done a lot of other things just as studies that interest me, but, uh, but, it, you know, it apparently wildlife and natural, natural subject matter is what really, uh, is my thing because that's just what I keep doing. And, um, and it's but not that, all because I was going to say, but are you continuing doing that because that the market is dictating it? In other words, uh, your, your galleries are going, yeah, that's really sell. I want to, I've got clients for those. Give me those. Yeah, no, I was going to say that it's, you know, it's not just because of that, although it, it's a, it's a catch 22 because, you know, you, you get known for a certain thing and then that's what, what, you know, people are wanting and then you just keep doing that and then it just goes in this cycle. So, I mean, I have control over that to some degree of, of doing other things, but no, the, the wildlife and the landscapes are my first choice, but um, I don't really, I, I just consider myself an artist. I, you know, my top priority is just doing good paintings and the subject matter is entirely secondary. So it just so happens that the thing that really gets me uh, excited about an idea is usually wildlife or a landscape. Yeah, because I would so, I would pose that most of those paintings that you did stand on their own without even any wildlife in it, like the other uh, brown bear, the grizz. I don't know what it was the mm -hmm. in the you know the with the rock. Yeah, that smaller painting. I mean, that was a great landscape. It was like a little. Carl Rungus or, or a yeah. Frank Tenney Johnson, for that matter, little landscape. So, you know, I, I could see you as a landscape artist, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, 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 I would like to, and I intend to do more of those. I, I have lots of, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, but I have an, a fair number of ideas that I would like to try to do that I, I've, I've tried to figure out how to make them a setting for, for an animal figure or a wildlife right. painting. And I just can't because if I put something else in there, it it actually takes away from the what makes the the idea so good. Yes. And, and so it it I've got some ideas that they they have to be pure landscapes. Yeah. If I put, put a little mouse or something in the corner. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. <laughs> or like burning out or the blue. All you have to do is Put a few little uh, dots in the sky, and yeah, there uh, you go. You got and it's birds. some kind of bird flying through there. Now it's a wildlife painting. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So, kind of re reversing course now and going to where you grew up. I found out uh, that you actually grew up somewhere very close to where I grew up. So you're from uh -huh. Texas, right? Or yeah, from west yeah. Western Texas, Mid Midland, Texas. Yeah, so I grew up very close to there. Where where was that? Portales, New Mexico. Portales, oh my gosh! I know. You grew you up there. What's that? You grew up there. Yeah, yeah. All the way through school. Yeah, from kindergarten. Um, I had no idea. School through, yeah. No, that's because I don't talk like that. Right. And you don't either. How come? Well, we both must have taken the same uh, uh, speech class to get rid of the accent, right? <laughs> I mean, because Midland's pretty. That's a good accent there. So, yeah and did you it is you know and i don't say i think i used to have more of one i've i've been in denver for 30 years so um you know if i go back to texas i think i could slip back into it very easy too much. i find myself yeah. as i get older i find i do it more often there was a person that was just in my gallery from clovis new mexico and that's so i just walked in after talking to him and i was immediately back into that you know dialect of where i grew up so you grew did you grow up in midland that's where you pretty much yeah we moved there when i was eight years old so i think that counts as and then i i actually lived there for um uh almost around 10 years after college i went back there oh, wow. after college was um your, was your family in the oil and gas business or anything like that not originally. We we moved there. There was an aircraft company starting up in Midland, of all places, uh, a local dentist that had been experimenting with composites in his dental practice. Mm. 
but he was also an airplane uh, fan, I guess. And he started designing a all composite airplane. This is in the, it might even have been back in the late fifties, but certainly the er early sixties. And by the late sixties, he had a, he had an aircraft, little aircraft company going and they hired my dad away from Cessna. We lived in Wichita before that. My dad worked at Cessna and they hired him away as an engineer mm -hmm. for this company in Midland. And that's why we moved there. But the, the company, the plane was a great plane, but the company just didn't, couldn't uh, sustain it. it. It just couldn't, it just couldn't. I don't really know what happened, but it just didn't succeed as a business. So within a couple of years, two or three years, he had to find uh, work and everything else there was, was oil related. So yeah. he, he went to work for a company that designed uh, drill bits and things like that. So, And then he, from there, he just bounced back and forth between, uh, eventually he went back into the air craft business with um i forget somebody in fort worth yeah and um so he um and he did a lot of consulting work uh both with airplanes and with oil field equipment so uh -huh. it just kind of bounced back and forth yeah i mean everybody there is in the oil and gas business even yeah. back in the day so yeah. have you been back to midland by the way to see what it looks like it doesn't look like it used to yeah, it's been about four years now. My my parents are both still around, but um, and they lived in Midland for fifty years. Wow. But uh, they just moved away to Arlington, Texas, mm -hmm. about four years ago to be near one of their kids. And my sister in Arlington is the yeah lucky one. Yeah. Um, so, but uh. I don't really have any reason to go there anymore. I don't have a lot of friends left there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I still know plenty of people there, but not people I'm in touch with. And so it's been about four years, but even then, you know, and, and for the previous you know, 10 or 20 years before that, every time we went there, um, it was just an astonishing the, the how it had expanded, you know, right. To well, the north. I have an art museum that's showing art and doing a lot of things right now. Uh, which one? I, 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 don't, I actually can't remember the name of it. I know that uh, Museum Black, of the uh, Southwest. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Museum of the Southwest. Yeah, Southwest. Yeah. I, Thomas Blackshire has a exhibit that's going on right now there. Oh, really? Okay. I don't know if you knew that. But. I knew I knew it was going to uh, San Antonio, San Angelo, but I didn't know it was gonna. It was in Midland. Yep, it's in Midland. So okay. when, you, when you were growing up as a kid, was there? Wait, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting him. I'm getting confused about that. Anyway, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a show. I think it was a one man show um, okay. that he has there. Cause I was going to try to go see it just cause I love his work and you know, it's fun to kind of go back to that area just to see what's going on. But, but when you were a kid, was there any art to be seen? There wasn't where I grew up. There was nothing except native. No. Stuff. No, I mean, the Museum of the Southwest was there. And in fact, it actually did play a role, a small role in, in uh, me being a, uh, a full-time artist. Um, this might be a little bit of a story here, but um, for a long time, from, from my mid-teens up through my late 20s, I did bird sculpture out of wood. Mm. You know, the realistic bird carving thing. Yes, and um, I discovered that because there was a local man in Midland named Perry Holly, who who he was a retired cabinet maker, but he he just after he retired, he sort of what he called he took up what he called uh, whittling birds, you know, yeah. he just wow. carved them and painted them. And he was pretty accomplished for um, for being, a, you know, a cabinet maker. I mean, he he he. He did them reasonably well. In retrospect, you know, they weren't like you see the best in the world stuff, but they were pretty good. But my, I took an art class in high school when I was about, I guess it was my sophomore year. And we did a, we had a field trip down to the Museum of the Southwest and we walked by this cabinet and the, the, the woman giving us the tour you know, pointed to these carved birds and said, this is a local man that carves birds. And the, 
And then they continued on. The rest of the class continued on. And I stayed there. <laughs> I just was blown away that you could you could do that out of wood. Yeah. You know? So um, I stayed there looking at those and uh, eventually tracked him down and uh, uh, sort of learned the basics from him. And that got me started on that. Uh, were so, you doing art i assume as a kid like in you know kindergarten first grade and all that primary school that you were probably already in the art kind of it was in your blood so to speak yeah i mean i was um i i've heard other artists say this too you know uh even i think even on some of your other podcasts about being the kid in the class where the teacher sort of takes notice and then yeah. the other kids stand around to see what she's so impressed by and you right. you get a little of attention for for being able to draw yes and so i was the good i was the good drawer in yeah, class you were, you were the class artist yeah and that sort of thing um and i you know i was doing that as far back as i can remember uh just drawing and making up stuff and making up different kinds of dinosaur you know not necessarily trying to draw the real dinosaurs but just making them up and mm -hmm. And, uh, and then, um, you know, it evolved into, uh, started playing around with oil paints when I was maybe 10 or 11. And, wow. That's uh, early. Yeah. yeah. I don't, we had some at home. I don't know how we had them. Uh, my grandmother was a, a hobbyist oil painter mm -hmm. and, you know, that could have been where they came from, but, um, I was, I was, uh, sort of fooling around with those and my my mother sort of enrolled me in a little very informal little group oil painting class with a woman that lived a couple of miles away where and I think everyone else in the class was an adult but mm. I was the kid there but it was like a weekly thing where you went and you just painted what you wanted to paint she circulated and helped you you know try to get a little better and teach you a few things and and that that sort of got me started with the basics of oil painting um and then i just i just um you know dabbled with it uh for the next the rest of my uh, school years just you'd get on a i'd go months without doing anything and then i would decide i want to try painting something and so here and there i would paint but it was just always there just not necessarily my main thing you know so your mom obviously saw something there for her to find that and put you in with that lady with adults. Mm -hmm. too, she clearly saw something, I would think. Well, yeah, I mean, there that'd be maybe part of it. And she may have thought that um, I should also, if I'm going to do that, uh, you know. Take it seriously. Yeah, well, learn, you know, learn it from someone else instead of having to figure it out for yourself yeah so. yeah your piano lessons but they were painting lessons exactly yeah, yeah. which is uh, i think unusual actually when that happens mm -hmm. often you know parents yeah. don't see that as a the creativity as being something of merit sometimes if you're yeah. a baseball player now that's a different story especially if you're a football player at midland oh uh, of course yeah, um, yeah. Did, did you go to the I, football games i mean they're big there yeah well i did i i actually you know tried to play football when I was a kid. And then when I, by the time I got in junior high, I was starting to get outgrown. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, I, I, and it's funny, I, that was actually my, uh, probably my dream was to grow up and be a, a, a wide receiver in the <laughs> NFL, but it just was not in the cards. So yeah. it just <laughs> wasn't made for it, but, um, but no, I loved football and, uh, um, and yeah, you're right. It's huge. Uh, oh, huge. It's huge in all those towns. Yeah. You know, and they all, you know, Artesia, Hobbs, Carlsbad, all those. And they all had great football teams, too. Yeah. You know that um, the the Friday Night Lights thing um, where uh, Odessa Permian, about the Odessa yeah. Permian season, um, there's a there's sort of a climactic game in that book where. Um, Oh, Permian plays Midland Lee, which was the school I went to. And uh, I was at that game <laughs> as uh -huh. a spectator. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
There you have it, folks. <laughs> he really he, is Midland. <laughs> that was the game. That was, I think, the only game Permian lost that year. And I may be wrong about that, but I think it was the only game they lost in the regular season. And then, you know, and the next day there's for sale signs in the head coach's yard because they lose one game. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, that's shameful. <laughs> that's just unacceptable. Yeah, no, it is. I understand that. Yeah, yeah. So when you uh, – when you in, you're in high school and you're painting on occasion. You're interested in it. Clearly, you've been doing it since a kid. I assume you probably won an award or something too, or along the way when you're in as well. The rec any recognition? No, no. I, I I wasn't in any sort of organized art. I, I wasn't. I was just doing it on my own at home here and there. Um, and uh, I took what just art one year in high school, and uh, that was just learning how to draw you know perspective and kind of right. all those fundamental things and um and then like i said during that year is when i discovered the the carving thing and and that seemed like my i thought i can clearly remember having the thought that i'm so lucky i have found the thing that i'm going to do the rest of my life yeah, so that's an artist you're you're recognizing your because brain but specifically the bird carving thing because it combined art yeah. woodworking which i had a big interest in which i had to, you know i had take i took wood shop all through school and that and nature not uh birds and it just combined those three things and i thought i i'm made for this you know and this is what i'm going to do uh actually i didn't really think i would be doing that for a living until but in college i started thinking about doing it full time and i did for for a few years after college and when you but were in I, college what were you were you a zoology major yeah i, I majored in wildlife biology yes um i went to a and m and the reason i went there is i was gonna i, I was gonna i, I signed up uh, as a pre-vet major and I, and and the first year or so of classes the pre-vet major was exactly the same thing as uh wildlife biology almost and so um, it was, um, you know, about the time I went into college, I realized I was far more interested in in wildlife than in domestic mm. taking care. Of. And and one of the biggest discouragements was my local vet told me that uh, really when you're a veterinarian, you deal with the pets owners more than the pets. Is a problem. <laughs> and, and and I that I didn't like that. So, um, uh, but really, when I discovered that there was a, a that you could actually major in wildlife biology, I didn't even know that sort of thing existed until I got the curriculum book. But when I found when I discovered that, um, that's what I went into. It was an easy decision, um, not nearly as potentially lucrative, but you know, you got to do what you love to right. do so and you're still carving the birds while you're doing this uh, i haven't done one in 20 years but when you were in college were you still were you oh still yeah them? and were you selling them yeah i did i did them all through college and uh and i and i started getting uh, a lot of commissions from uh around west texas as you, you know as we've talked about there was lots of oil money there and people had no problem uh spending money on on uh bird carvings yeah so um, i had uh chickens. what's prairie, that prairie chickens and quails and uh quail a lot of quail yeah coming birds and and everything was a commission you know yes. everything was people calling me and saying they'd love to have a pair of bob white or whatever yeah. um and so all through college these commissions sort of built up and uh and that's what I did as a summer job, pretty much all through college was just go home and, and do carvings. Yeah. And that's when I realized maybe I could actually do this full time. But even then I, I, I was, I looked, I tried a little bit to find a job in wildlife mm -hmm. biology when I graduated, but the jobs were really, and I think they probably always have been, were really hard to find. Yeah, I'm um, sure they are. You had to do everything. You had to do everything right. You had to have really good grades. You had to, you had to do, uh, 
you know, apprenticeships in the summers, whatever, which I didn't do. Uh, instead, I carved birds. So, right. <laughs> uh, but you had, you know, you had to do all these things to get your position yourself to be the most uh, um, viable candidates for um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife or the state game and fish agencies around the country, whatever it was, you know. Um, and even the best, very best students that in that major were uh, generally needing to go on to grad school or something because the mm-hmm. jobs just weren't there. And uh, so I just couldn't see going to grad school at the time. I just didn't have the long-term vision and patience for that. And uh, and I knew I had this fairly healthy list of commissions by the time I graduated. So I thought I'm just going to go back to middle and try carving birds for a while. It seemed like the ideal thing, even right. though my parents, um, uh-huh. you know, <laughs> They let they they didn't they didn't uh, resist too much, but they weren't crazy about that, you know. And <laughs> I bet and I course, can see that. I remember the lecture about you know you need to you really should go out and get some experience working working for somebody and that sort of thing. And and he was and they were exactly right. But when you're 22 and you know you don't you don't realize the value of experience necessarily and and all that stuff. So. Um, so that's what I did for about the next ten years or so, and uh, and I and I got and I quite honestly I got tired of it. Um, yeah. It just wasn't. Um, it just was not artistically fulfilling. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, almost all commission work. Uh, so I had lots of ideas that I would want, wanted to do, but uh, you know, I needed to get these commissions done, and I had to make some money it wasn't even that lucrative so right people didn't people didn't value that and may still not as a a true art form it's sort of somewhere between a uh, a crafty thing and art you know do they ever come back on the market do you ever see any of your um back up it's it's i'm aware that it's happened once or twice i mean i i did get a notice one time about uh one of my old carvings in an, in a little auction somewhere and they wanted to know the value. Yeah. What'd you tell them? <laughs> I, I couldn't even imagine. I had no clue. And it, and some of those older carvings weren't very good. So, yeah. you know, um, I, I had no idea. I don't remember what I even, what my response was. Yeah. So you didn't want to try to buy it back and put, put it, do you no, uh, have those carvings at all? The, the other problem with the, the wood carvings is, you know, they're not going to last. They're just so delicate. They're so susceptible to damage that uh, they're not an enduring. I mean, you know, certainly if they're well taken care of, they, they can be. But I don't see them lasting like a, a, a painting or a sculpture, a, you know, metal sculpture. So, so you do that for 10 I, years in Midland. And then what happened? Yeah. You get bored with carving, and yeah, um, yeah. And the other part of that whole thing is, uh, it, it's all about detail. I mean, at least for me, it was all about making them look as real as possible. So it's just a huge amount of detail, and the vast majority of the time and effort in them, it was just all that detailing. Mm-hmm. So the, the fun, exciting part was. Um, the new idea and conceiving an idea and developing it and the and composing it and then the initial sculptural part of it was fun and then and when you got down to all the details uh you're just like um it's just an endurance thing you're back to a whittler to see it, to see it finished you know yeah. yeah to see it done that that was the motivation but most of the time that you're doing that you're you're just wanting to move on to the next thing. So um, it wasn't. And you're not even getting the freedom of getting to set up a lot of these pieces, how you want to see it compositionally. Right. They're they're literally saying, no, I just need two Bob whites. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and and sometimes they would say, Oh yeah, I saw, I saw a pair of Bob whites at so-and-so's house. I'd, I'd love to have something just like that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Whatever. 
So. Yeah. And you're like, you look at your car, or your truck and go, okay, that'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Need to make that better. Yep, exactly. So what was that? So happened? anyway, yeah, that, the, that lasted a few years, but. Um, yeah, well, 10 years, it sounds like. That's more than a few. Yeah. That's a yeah, decade. I guess it was close yeah. to it. Yeah. So how, what was the epiphany to say, okay, I got to do something else? Okay, well, um, and and I, you know, I've talked about this in, in other uh, interviews, but um, I also was, uh, as it turns out, I ended up playing music in a band there in Midland yeah. for most of that time, too. Yeah. And that turned in almost like a, a, a dual existence at two jobs, you know, and, and the, the band was not full time professional, but we played every weekend and. Uh, and, you know, and it was a decent little uh, side thing. And, and it was just really fun. And so, frankly, that's what kind of kept me there for the last I see. three, four years was create because I didn't want to I didn't want to quit that. Yeah. What did and, you do? We were, did you play? Would you play? or uh, I, I played I played drums. Yeah. All right. And um, what was the name of the band? Let's hear the name of the band. Um, it was we were called the Shades. Yeah. <laughs> and the Shades was a name thought up before the band existed for about six months before I uh, joined. Uh, yeah. So I had nothing to do with the name, but, um, but uh, anyway, and it, you know, we were pretty popular played all over the, all those little towns. In fact, we played all the little towns in Eastern New Me Southeastern New Mexico. We played cause you know, these towns like uh, Hobbs and Artesia and Lovington. Um, Lovington uh, uh, all had their their country clubs, right? Yes. And uh, and and most of those towns would have some big event at some point during the year, a big Valentine's Day right. dance at the country club or whatever. And uh, you know, we just were gainfully employed, going to all these little West Texas and Eastern New Mexico towns, playing at these deals, and they paid very well, yeah, because they plenty of money. And were you so, playing like cover band things for Western? Yeah, Western? it was all country and it was mostly, you know, classic rock and roll, everything from the 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 late 50s stuff, which we didn't really like as much to right. the more current 80s right. stuff. Right. And everything in between, kind of mainly like 60s and early 70s stuff. Yeah. And uh, um. And then we we played a certain amount of country because there it's were like certain Bob, certain places. Carlsbad, all they wanted, yeah. For the first hour or so, you had to at least uh, pacify the the crowds yes. that that wanted country. Yeah, that was all the radio. And then, and, there were was country and western, basically, unless you could get well. There, there was some there were some rock and roll stations in Midland, Odessa, but not where we were. Yeah. Yeah, well, not there was, but, but, anyway, um, but we we played. It was all cover stuff, and it was all about you know, people recognize. You know, you played stuff people knew. Yeah, uh, you played things too obscure or or mm -hmm. certainly originals. You right. know, you would lose them completely. Right. So we played stuff everybody knew, and um, and it was all geared towards. Um, uh, the crowd having a good time and us getting uh d having a demand to play you know it and was it was a business it was kind of run like a business and there was plenty of songs that i just was sick and tired of playing <laughs> or, or never did like right but everyone else did so you didn't have this ide ideation maybe i could go to we the shades could go to la and maybe make their own music and do a breakout we weren't thinking L.A., but we were thinking Austin for a while. Yeah, I mean, okay. not, not full, you know, not moving there, but but trying to Fine. break into playing in Austin now and then. But we never did that. We played as far away as like Santa Fe and we played at Rio Dosa fairly frequently at the Bull Ring. Mm -hmm. There's a place there called the Bull Ring. And, and, that, and there was a Bull Ring in Santa Fe, actually. That's why we're up there. Yeah. But anyway, that's about it. You know, so we had a uh a few hundred mile range yeah you know 
a big circle around the middle of Odessa. Yeah. Um, but mostly there locally. Um, but anyway, so that that was uh, what I, you know, that's really what was keeping me there for the last two or three, four years. Right. Um, and then and then that, you know, a couple of the original guys quit that were were my better friends in the band. And, you know, it was just uh, time to yeah. grow up and move on. Right. And pull the shades and, down, so to speak. Exactly. So, so uh, I had a uh, um, a couple of friends who had moved to Denver, and and then I also had a girlfriend who had been transferred to Denver, and um, and so uh, and I as also I had also all through the last several years had uh, become quite enthused about skiing, snow skiing, um, and so. And I loved Colorado, so just kind of everything lined up. It, it's time to move to Colorado, so mm-hmm. that's what I did. Moved to uh, moved to Denver, and um, I spent the first winters just skiing the whole time. I, I actually lived out in the in the um, ski town. I forget which one. And how <laughs> Silver, did you... <laughs> Silver Center or something? Silverthorne, I think. Yeah. How'd you make a living? What'd you do? Uh, I well, I didn't while I was skiing. I just I had some money, you know, yeah. a little bit of money saved. Right. So I just uh, lived on that and skied. You're your uh, early thirties at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, thirty thirty one. Um, and then and then that was my little window to do that. And then then by that first summer, I I you know moved down to Denver and. You know, I could have continued doing the bird carving. Um, and in fact, I, I did continue doing that. I still had commissions, but but I was also thinking this, there's, you know, opportunities here, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And uh, just fairly quickly, I I was in the right place at the right time to get a position at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, or it was called Denver Museum of Natural History at that time. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was an opening in the zoology department. And uh, I I somehow found out about it and went down there and mm-hmm. applied for the interview and got the job. So that- mom and dad was happy, I'm sure. Yeah, well, it's funny, you know, the, the 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 degree ended up paying off. Yeah. Cuz that actually had a had something to do with me getting that job was uh, my experience with in college I had done a lot of specimen preparation where you you know, in zoology with birds and mammals you make these little study skins. Yes. Uh and, and with insect pinning, I know you're was it was it your dad? It's an entomologist. Yeah, entomolo- yeah that's an entomologist, ichthyologist too. Yeah. And I, you know, I took entomology courses, so I knew how to prepare insect specimens, all that stuff. So, uh, so that, that helped a lot with me getting the job. And, uh, and I thought, well, this will be, uh, this will be great. This will be good fun for, a, you know, a little while. Right, why and I, I see. <laughs> Yeah, and I stay there 12 years. It was, it was actually more than a little fun. It was fantastic. And uh, I loved it. And uh, at least for the first few years, uh, then the administration changed a little bit. And, you know, how these, it doesn't matter whether it's a corporate company or a nonprofit company, there's always a little bit of, you know, not politics, but a lot of the the morale depends on who's running the show sort of thing. And Right, culture. So the the museum kind of took a turn in the late nineties in a direction I wasn't crazy about. Um, but I still enjoyed working there, but, uh, but all through that time. So since I started working there, I, 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 since I was working full time now, uh, I could just do art, just anything I wanted to do. Right. Right. So I, I took a color theory class and, uh, discovered, I'd sort of rediscovered oil painting or painting based. I started out with, acrylics but i um i just got the bug to paint and um so then i you know i switched to oils pretty quickly and uh and i started meeting artists 
at the museum, actually, a lot of uh, animal or nature artists would come into the museum to to work, do studies from the taxidermy mounts, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was the guy that had to be, I was the guy taking care of all that stuff. I was the, the zoology collections manager. So I had, I, I, you know, it was under my purview to uh, take care of all those, those old, old taxidermy mounts. And, uh, and they were, open, you know, it was, it was a little bit like a library. They were available to use uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the taxidermy stuff. We generally didn't loan out, but, um, but people were welcome to come in to the museum and, and work from them. And were you peppering the artists with questions about, hmm, how do you do this? And how can you make a look? Yeah, you know, I felt like I knew. Uh, it's not like I didn't know the technical stuff. It was um, um, it was more that I was just envious that they were getting to sit there and do that. You know, right. and I, during the course of the day, I would wander through now and then just to see how their drawing was going or whatever. Right. And and I and I made some artist friends that way, and uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up meeting some some really top painters in Denver. Uh, Mark Daly, are you familiar with him? I know the name. Mm -hmm. uh, just a brilliant painter, uh, colorist, and uh, I met Mark Daly. I met and eventually met Mike Lynch. Um, and others and uh you know it's just started absorbing things from from them yeah and uh and that was more than anything my 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 painting education and uh and i took i took classes with mark at the art students league and um um but it and you know and i got exposed to the 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 outdoor painting thing, which plain air. was cool. Yeah. But that that, that changed everything when I started painting outdoors. And why is that? Um well you're seeing your 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 I think you my color the color in my in my painting just got much better because you're you're painting straight from the source. Yeah. And, and you're, you're focusing seeing, on that too. You're focusing on the outdoors, you're focusing on the color. It's yeah. super concentrated focus you know the two hours flies by yes. and but but you, you you're seeing these things that you just couldn't see any other way there's no way you would be able to see that stuff to those subtle things that uh you can only see in person and 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 it makes you work fast you you just you just figure things out because you have to and uh it just revolutionized what i was doing and unlike a bird feather that you've done a million times, it's all changing, it's all different, and it keeps you stimulated. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 since you have to work fast and you have to, you know, there's it's it was about implying things or suggesting things instead of rendering things. Mm -hmm. You know, when when you're mm -hmm. sitting at home with all your reference material, you can just get really caught up in and I'm um, just drawing and rendering and instead of really painting and uh, and and using uh, suggestion and so on. So it, it just really developed that for me to whatever degree it has been developed. Right. Uh, and uh, um, so anyway, that's all going on while I'm working at the museum and just uh, eventually, you know, around the late 90s, 2000, I... I'm realizing that really I want to just be home painting every day. And I, and I stuck it out at the museum another four years and I eventually um, decided to make the break and, and paint full time in 2004. And so how and, old are you then? You're in your forties at that point. Yeah. Right? So by then I'm like 44, 45. Yeah. And do you, and is, is there a point there you go, if I don't do this, it's not going to happen ever. Well, yeah, it's pretty much part of it. Um, you know, I've been wanting to quit and and a, a huge, you know, I have to say a huge part of it was uh, I'd gotten married in 96 and my wife has two artist sisters. She's totally, was totally behind the art thing, totally supportive. And she was actually, uh, you know, 
pushing me to quit before I ever, you know, for a good yeah. two or three years before I actually did. She said, you yeah. really should just do this. Yeah. But I, I just felt like I needed to get, I just needed to be a little more sure of it. Um, and uh, we were at, um, in 2004, I was in that birds and art show in, in, um, in Wisconsin, uh, up at the Woodson Museum. And I was talking to an artist there. I think his name is Ronnie Williford, is who it was. Mm -hmm. Do you know him? Mm -hmm. I think he's the brother of Hollis Williford. Yeah, anyway, I did it. There's a book on Hollis Williford that just came out, actually. Which yeah. Is a very good book. I remember standing under a tent up there. And Debbie, my wife, standing with me, and we're talking to Ronnie, and and I'm just sort of complaining about just wanting to paint, you know, all right. the time. He said, "Well, you just got to do it." He said, "You got to quit and do it. You'll be amazed how much better you'll get." Mm -hmm. And he just he just went on and on and just gave me this huge pep talk about just really pushed me to to quit, and that's when I made up my mind, and I came home and literally immediately gave my two week notice. Uh -huh. Wow, so that's, that's amazing! Yeah. yeah, that's just the stimulus you needed to be able. It to was go. just that one extra push I needed, I think, at that time. And yes. uh, and I'm not even—I don't even know him well. I don't even know if he would remember me, but I remember that real clearly. And I—I uh, I should I—I I owe him a little bit. Shout out to him right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think one of the things is. You know, and I can relate to it because I quit being a doctor to, you know, be an art dealer. But, yeah, you know, you know, I do have to pay things. Right. You have mortgages, you have whatever. And it's a scary feeling to go, OK, I'm on my own. You know, you're fortunate because you had a lovely wife that would be there for you. And I was as well. But, you know, it's still like, you know, I, you got to find a gap. You've never, you know, I, I assume you probably didn't have a gallery at that point. Nope. Right? Yeah. You have nothing. Right. Right. Well, <laughs> no. Um, and I, I must say. Uh, not only was I fortunate with her attitude about it, but she was she had a very nice career in the cable TV industry. There you go. So she was doing very well. And so all that added up to a pretty uh, safe uh, decision, you know, to, to paint full time. It's just that I wanted to I just wanted it to work. You know, I, it wasn't right. so much. Uh, a financial fear as it was um uh, i just i wanted to succeed you know yeah you don't want to failure right well when you do that jump you are now calling yourself an artist when people mm -hmm. ask what do you do i'm an artist when the irs says fill out what you do it's an artist you know so yeah. I get, you know i, I understand yeah that. yeah and and to, and so yeah i i didn't have any galleries but i I gave myself a year or two to just um, do all the things I'd been wanting to do, but didn't have time. So that was a lot of being outside painting, going to a lot of places I'd been wanting to go to. Uh, and <clears throat> just, just uh, working out a few things, you know, um, just painting a lot and just, um, get getting a little bit of a body of work together mm -hmm. and then uh i think my first gallery was in 2006 sometime in 2006 what gallery and was that it's just, it was um the basalt gallery in basalt colorado mm -hmm. and they've since you know changed hands and it's the and the i don't know how you say the last name it's a greek right. name Krogula, Kroglos gallery yeah, okay I don't know how it's pronounced, but it's still there in Basalt. It's the same location. It's just a different ownership and name. And it's it's you, a real nice gallery. Huh? How'd you get that? How'd you get the uh, into the gallery? Uh, I just approached. I just cold. I just cold called them. Uh, right. Them and some others, probably. But um, and was it with plain air paintings, or were you also no, doing the wildlife it stuff? Was, it was just the wildlife stuff. Yeah. Okay. Mostly. And I, and I had a gallery. I got into a gallery in uh, Bozeman, Montana, Chaparral Fine Art, mm -hmm. and they lasted about a few years after I was there, and eventually closed up. And um, you know, and then from there, it was just once you get into two or three galleries, then you can start, you know, um, 
being a little more selective and right. you know a little more in the driver's seat about what you're doing and and it, it was just a very slow gradual thing from there uh i i didn't have any real momentous uh or breakthrough events that happened you know it's just been very gradual and steady i got real to yeah go ahead no zero name recognition for quite a while you uh-huh. know well, I, I think that's more common than you think. I think a lot of people think you get this, oh, boom, and you're, you know, you're found and who you are. And I don't think that's, I think the real thing is it's a, it is a steady yeah. push forward, work at your trade, your craft, your art. And if you do that long enough, you know, you're gonna, it seems like at least the artists I've worked with and know that you'll find your lane. Yeah. And um, you know, I, uh, I'm not saying what I was doing then was, was not good, but I've definitely improved a lot since yeah, then. Of course. Yeah, I believe that. You've been painting now for 20 years, right? I mean, as an artist, as, yeah. as your job. Which is pretty amazing to think about. I can't yeah. believe it's been that long. Longer than you were a zoologist at the right. museum. Yeah. 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 But back one before I forget. So when did you uh, uh, switch from uh, doctor to art dealer? So I opened my gallery in '92, so okay. you know, 31 years ago. But I was buying and selling and doing stuff before that. Even when I was still a military doctor, I was doing stuff, and I did stuff in my residency as well. So I was, you know, I started probably as a real job like that, or not as a real job, but as doing things like that. Maybe '88. Something like that, eighty nine. Yeah. Was was your? Did you always have an interest in the in the arts? Before I mean, no. when did that happen? No, because we didn't have any arts in uh-huh. the house. I had an interest in native stuff, you know, because there was a, a little museum that had Clovis points and things like that, you know, yeah. th- those kind of things. I had interest, in, you know. My next door neighbor, A. T. Cox, had bob wire fences displays which i found fascinating you know <laughs> you know but there really wasn't art to be had and i was focused on science primarily so i was involved in a bunch of science things you know i went to international science fairs a couple times and you know those kind of things so i was very i did very very well in science and got a lot of major national awards in science so i was just focused on that but there was a point where that flipped. And once, it, as, as you know, once it flips, it flips, you know, yeah. you know, yeah. you're out painting those plain air paintings and go, Oh my God. Yeah. You know, you just, you know, when I get to be around art and wonderful native Amer- American material and the artists and the creativity people, and, you know, just like, okay, well, this is, this is more interesting and fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> huh. so, and then you're in, and once you're all in, you're all in. Right? Yeah. I don't think about going back and seeing, you know, patients or anything. So, <laughs> though they still occasionally ask me questions, that's fine. But I'm an art dealer. You know, that's what I put on my IRS art dealer. <laughs> yeah. I don't have people calling me Dr. Sublet. I smart, you know. So, right. yeah. So, back to you, who is way more important than this conversation than me. So you start getting galleries and then you start succeeding. And so you kind of start hitting your stride mid fifties, would you say? Um, yeah. Um, maybe early, you know, I don't know about hitting stride, but I, I started, I feel like I kind of really got started getting some good traction in my early fifties, like yeah. 2010 or, or so. Um, I got into, you know, maybe 2011 or so I got into uh I got I got noticed by Legacy Gallery and that was a big deal to get into Legacy and then I got in started getting into Western Visions and some of these other little some little and some major shows um and uh and then yeah again it it was just this gradual increased traction and Mm -hmm. uh probably coinciding with my work getting a little better and uh and then you know one thing leads to another as well with you get in one thing and then somebody notices you and then you know how that goes that's true 
I mean, this is really important to, to get those to, to be exposed. You have yeah, to be yeah. working it, right? Yeah, and, and I found out, you know, I didn't find out, but I, I, I knew this, but uh, it certainly proved true to that it was real important to actually show up to these things, to be there yeah. in person. Yeah. Um, having conversations with people, you know, and uh, that's that's helped a lot, so... Um, and just from a technical standpoint, how did you do your price structuring as you go along? Because when you begin, you don't know. What, I mean, you're 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 used to your carvings price structure, but you know what? Do you, how do you price these things, and how did that? You know. Well, yeah, that's uh, everything in the art business is so. There's no edges to anything. Right. There's no edges to anything. Uh, there. So, and that includes pricing. Um, so starting out, I just tried to uh, sort of look around, see what other people are doing and sort of try to put, you know, find your, where you fit into all that. And, um, and just, I, I think I probably erred on the low side. If anything, I thought it might be better to err on the low side. And that's usually what happens, by the way, that's usually what most artists do. Yeah. I just felt like, it was better to, to be able to raise the prices than to lower them yeah. or whatever. But, uh, but then, you know, if you're quite honestly, I feel like I started out fairly low and I was pretty conservative about raising prices. And um, I've always been pretty, pretty reasonably priced, you might say. Yeah. Uh, to the point where I've had, plenty of other artists and dealers say uh you know i need to get my prices up type of thing right so um i think i said that you, you did yeah okay well i don't represent I, you but i think when i looked at it, it seemed yeah they seem pretty reasonable well they are they're reasonable <laughs> is one way to put it i guess um but um yeah but but at the same time you know i haven't Quite honestly, I have not uh, felt like there is a that people are are there's just a, an overwhelming demand for my work. I mean, it sells everything. Right. In, almost everything I do ends up selling, but it doesn't literally fly off the wall. Like, right? You know, there's artists out there that are so they can't do anything wrong, you know. Right. Uh, and I've never really experienced that. So I've I've been. I've I've been trying to balance uh, getting my prices in line with what I'm doing, but at the same time, not. Um, I just I'm trying to be careful about it. So I think that's smart. I do. I think it is smart. I think artists can go too fast, too hard, and that can really be problematic. Mm -hmm. But you can also be where you're too conservative. I think in some respects, that's where you need to rely on your gallerists. You know, mm -hmm. ask their opinion, and you know see what they have to say you know? yeah you know, and then... yeah and, I, and i've i've done that a bit you know or at least uh getting a feel from them on you know oh, the interest in what i'm yeah. doing as right. far as you know so uh anyway um but quite honestly my uh my priority is on just doing good work yeah pain and, <laughs> um and you know, of course, I, I I want my prices to, I want them to reflect the value of the work. Not, it's not about making money as much as just having them be valued appropriately. You know, yeah, I get it. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's your legacy too, right? I mean, this is yeah. this is what people are going to know you for a hundred years yeah. from now. And so, let me ask you this question, just because I think you're in a unique position having started later in life as an artist, right? You really didn't kick in until you're like in your forties. What, right. what advice would you give to other individuals that might actually be out there in that same boat? Um, well, um, you know, I don't know if I have any real good <laughs> advice. Doesn't have to be um, good I, advice. How, how about just, um observations that you found that you have yeah. had over that time right? well 
if somebody's got, you know, it, it all it has to start with, I think, if a if somebody feels like they've got the quality of work that is going to allow them to succeed to begin with, you know, and it, but if they do and they love it, then I would say absolutely do it, go for it. But you have to love it. It's not, um, it's not just this fun little thing, you know, it's not the idyllic existence that people think it's, right. I've never worked harder in my life uh at anything and especially the last <clears throat> the last couple of years you know i've really uh turned a little bit of a corner in terms of uh, uh my uh, uh getting a little more known um and i'm just busier than ever and it is just hard work yeah i mean i'm it's great but and and just getting getting good enough to um to to make it work is is hard work you know just it's just uh so it's just like anything else you have to if you're going to be good at it, you have to love it yeah i think you have to commit you have to completely commit and you have to be it's just it's just um you just really have to be into it <laughs> yeah yeah it just it's not it's not uh it's not a hobbyist thing. No, you know, not if you want to be a professional. Right. Yeah. Right. See it in the and there's way more to it than just painting or just doing the work. There's the whole business side and the, yeah. <clears throat> it's a business. I mean, unfortunately for me or for, for my sensibilities, there's the, there's the business part of it that all has of it. to be done. Every, it, it's true for all artists, right? Yeah. It is a business. You know, and it doesn't mean you don't get to do what you love to do and you create, but there's no doubt it still is a business. Yeah. Yeah. Even when I'm working as a gallerist, sometimes I'll, you know, I'm doing something like I'm hanging some paintings that are awkward or I'm picking up trash or doing something that's, you know, very mundane, but it's part of being a gallerist. I'm like, this is what it's like to be a gallerist, folks, right here. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, this, it's not just having cocktails and selling art. No, it's literal <laughs> physical, you know, work. Uh, well, you know, and for me, uh, you probably have to do some of this too, building shipping crates and. Oh, you know, yeah. All that stuff. And just, you know. Holding rugs, you know, yeah. whatever it may be. I mean, it's part of, you know, when people will say, well, you know, you're, you're successful. Yeah. Well, because you work at it, you know, yeah. it's, and every day you work at it, 10 o'clock at night, you're going, I got to get this answer because I didn't have enough time during the day. And I'm sure the same, I'm sure you would like to be not in this podcast, but sitting behind your easel working, you probably have, you know, things that are coming due and, you know, you have to take the time to do this. <clears throat> Yeah, well, this is this is actually kind of fun. So <laughs> good. Well, I'm having. Fun. I, like, I like talking art a lot. Yeah, you know, everybody. Your language, right? It's the language of what you love. Yeah, and it's easier than actually doing it. <laughs> much easier. <laughs> so, do you have anything coming up that you that people should know about, like any shows or your Instagram account and those kind of things, so we can kind of. Um, yeah. Well, uh, there's a show in. Uh, at the Steamboat Art Museum, oh, yeah. uh, December first, uh, a wildlife uh, a show that Tim Newton is the guest curator of, and uh, I have I'm I'm still trying to complete uh, two more for that, and uh, I told him my pieces were not going to be early. <laughs> yeah, and are they for sale as well? Is it exhibit and sale? Um. It is. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's funny, a, a little bit like the wool rock um, in that um, everything doesn't have to be for sale and you can actually, he, you know, you can, uh, you can borrow older pieces back mm -hmm. if you want. Um, so I did that with one of them. There's going to be three pieces there, but the other two I'm trying to have as new things available for sale. Um, so that's coming right up. And then um I'm going to participate in a Coors show mm. here in Denver for the first time in January. Although I, I could only commit about two pieces for that this time because mm -hmm. uh, uh, this, this fall, this year actually has just been uh, 
ridiculously busy, like way, way too much. It's yeah. just that I, I just couldn't uh, say no to these things. Yeah, it's hard. I think it's a hard. I, I really do want to avoid getting uh, this uh, over committed again. Yeah. yeah, it's just yeah. I don't think it's good for the quality of the work or anything else. And and um, your life. And yeah, and, and your stress level and so on. All that. But anyway, the Kura show, and then, uh, but that's just two, and then, um, and and it's time to be getting things done for the Briscoe show in March, mm -hmm. and then, um, and it's just, and then by then it'll be on to, you know, right, not only the galleries, but then the other shows coming up next year eventually. So it's just a never-ending cycle. Yeah. Do you have an Instagram account? Uh, I do. Uh, I think, I think it's William dot Alther is the Instagram thing. And then uh, Facebook is William Alther dot com. Okay. And that's the same. No, that's my website. I mean, the Facebook is just William Alther. Yeah. And your, and your website is William Alther dot com. Right. Yeah. And, and it, it, it needs to be f uh, filled out a little bit. Uh, just redid it. Uh, a couple of months ago and don't have nearly enough images on there yet, but so we're still sort of getting that fleshed out. My the business wife, part. My wife actually. <laughs> huh? The business what? part. The business part. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Not only the business part, but the computer part, you know, yeah, like, I, know. I, I don't hate, hate this stuff, but uh, I just, uh, I'm just not real, you know, real, real good with it. <laughs> my wife is actually doing most of the fa the website work because uh, she's much more of a natural with it, and she has a little bit of time to do that. And thankfully, was happy to do it. But we still got to get that get that a little better. Get yeah, a little she more was, she was delightful, by the way. I got when I, I got to meet her in in Oklahoma, and, and clearly yeah. all behind you, a hundred percent, and really yeah. biggest fan, which I love to see. Just, yeah. Yeah, I just super lucky. I don't know how I got so Yeah, lucky. you are. <laughs> yeah, we, we both are actually. Yeah. So is anything we missed out on and anything we need to talk about that we didn't? Uh you know, I I can't think of anything additional. Um, I mean, I just following your lead here. <laughs> okay. I know. Well, I'll lead you as far as I can, but I think we've kind of covered it all. It's a it's an interesting story, you know. I, I when well, I well, yeah. I mean, I don't think of you know. No, I don't know how other people think of their own story, but I don't think of it as being all that interesting. But I don't know. Let's just review a kid from but, but, Midland that becomes a bird carver. You know, that works as a zoologist in a museum who finds his love of art again and embraces it, and then does very very well. I think it's a pretty interesting story. Yeah. And and I, you know, I I listen to I, I've listened to quite a few of your other podcasts and uh and I and I am always interested in the other artists' stories. Um yeah. almost every time they're they're interesting to me. So usually it's a story of struggle. Yeah. It is. And I would say yeah. this is the same, right? Trying to find yeah. a pathway. I mean, you know, you are basically a professional artist more or less from high school on you just right you know the 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 uh the thing with me is i like i said earlier um you know by the time i was certainly by the time i was out of college i was thinking i had found my life's work with mm -hmm. that, that that wood sculpture thing um and you know it wasn't but um uh so it, it's sort of like i uh had to go away from art for a little bit and then come back to it. I, I never really went away, but I had, I just needed to do something else for a little while. Yeah. Well, I would pose that, that, yeah, that time frame of carving and doing all that was really setting in motion. You being your, you know, as a professional painter, because you, you're, you're learning the art of business, you're learning commitments, you're doing all that stuff. You're doing, you know, fine motor skill work as well. I mean, that's all preparatory for what you do now. So, you know, you may have yeah. started in 204, was it officially? But it was, yeah. it, I would put it more back 20 years earlier, personally. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and yeah, and 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 also I've I've heard you know noticed a lot with other artist stories that a lot of it sort of comes down to just uh, um, the right things happening at the right time. I mean, some painters uh, discover discover what they want to do young and and which would be the equivalent of me discovering the carving when I was young mm -hmm. yet but some are fortunate enough to truly find it when they're that age right mm -hmm. and and I I kind of had a false start there I guess even though as you say it it all adds up to the to the end result but um yeah so yeah it, it's just finding it meeting the right person at the right time there's just so much uh, serendipity involved as well. So, yeah, I think you find your way in life. I think you're yeah. always meant to be an artist and you are just trying to find the lane, you know, and the, yeah. your exposure yeah. in a museum was a wood carver. So that seemed like, okay, this could be the lane because I really enjoy this. I've been doing it since as long as I can remember. And so you went down that lane and it, it, you you did it for 10 years you know and but you realized it was just too boring basically it wasn't enough stimulation it didn't fulfill you like you needed to so you know i would have it wouldn't have surprised me if i had met that bill then i would say oh yeah you're going to be an artist you know you just you, you know you just have to keep struggling right yeah so yeah. you did and you yeah. made it <laughs> yeah. yeah better late than never <laughs> no, I mean, you know, there's a lot of artists like that. I mean, you're going to you're, you're going to potentially have 40 years of work out there before you're finished. Yeah, yeah. that's a yeah. lot. Yeah. yeah. And uh, like we talked about at the Woolrock, I I um, I, you know, I, I think uh, still still have but easily the best work ahead of me. So stuff I saw was true. Uh, so I, I'm excited to see what comes for, further. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah all right well thank you so much it was a pleasure actually getting to talk to you on the zoom and it was a pleasure talking to you and will rock you and your wife and you know i hope other people find your work like i did yeah me too i i sure appreciate uh you inviting me to do this and it was great to run into you there i because like i said I, i've you know i've watched your podcast for some time now and so it's yeah. just great to be in person. Yeah, it was meant to be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the uh I've never thought I would want a polar bear painting, but that one I did. <laughs> it was Yeah. Yeah. So well, there's I imagine there'll be more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it, that was interesting about your work. Everyone was very different, you know, yeah. from the landscape or the, you know, whatever it was, it, it felt very unique. Um which is I think unusual for me to see that in a lot. It's you know, yeah. Well, you know, every every piece I start on, I it I don't have a set way of doing it. It every every painting kind of goes in a different in its own way. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, I don't I don't I I almost feel like I don't know what I'm doing mm -hmm. uh, when I start each new piece it's like where do i i don't know where where to yeah. start here well pueblo potter is the same way they just say the clay teaches them and tells them where to go yeah they just kind of start taking on their own direction yeah and you, you sort of have to figure out how much of it is that you need to force and how much of it you need to let happen on yeah. its own yeah well. and they end up that may be part of why they are a little different and it's also a reason why um, not that I've been asked to teach, but it's a reason why I probably wouldn't. I would be reluctant to teach because I don't. I don't have a established way of doing things. Yeah, I wouldn't know how to teach it. That keeps it fresh. That yeah. makes it unique. Yeah. that's why yeah. that group of paintings all look unique and different. That's yeah. A good point. Uh, I I I think so too. I I actually like that. I don't. I don't have this sort of step-by-step uh, -step process. Yeah. Know? Yeah. No, I agree. That's, that's your, I mean, maybe that's your voice. That's what we, when, when I look at your paintings from now on, that will be the voice I see. It's never the same. It's a little different. Everything's subject matter picked different. 
you know, yeah. landscape and, different. And I think it also uh, makes uh, evolving and you know improving and evolving that easier or you know, yeah, more prone. To, yeah, it'll keep you from being pigeonholed for sure. Yeah, and to to get stagnant or whatever. Yeah, just you know. continue developing and evolving. I think that's why I asked that first question at the beginning. Are you a wildlife artist? You know? Yeah. Because, you know, you are, but you aren't. You know? Yeah. Well, like I said, I, I you know, I, I think of myself as an artist. And right. I happen to be doing a lot of wildlife. I would agree but, with that statement. But, yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. Well, thank you again. All right. I'll let you get back to your easel or whatever else things you're yeah. supposed to i'm sure it's in the studio <laughs> you're gonna have lunch and then head right to the studio right you you got it yep. you got it exactly right. <laughs> i understand i've got lunch a and then and then painting yeah. yeah all right well i hope we run into each other soon bill i do too yeah um yeah are you gonna go to the briscoe or anything this year oh don't know yet i might i'm gonna go to the booth uh that i know but i don't know if on the briscoe or not yet so right. well a, i'm sure it'll it'll be uh it'll somewhere be that terrible. yeah no it'll happen for sure all right okay very good give give your wife my thanks best. again yes i will i will all right thank, thank you, you. Bye -bye.